Cool. So welcome everyone. Um, this is a online meeting Docker 1.10 release. Um, and I think this is the first talk I've done where, the first joint talk I've done where we're doing it uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, and I'm coming to you from uh, London in the UK. Um, and we're also joined by uh, Dong Chen, who is a engineer on the core team um, who is over, to, over in San Francisco. Um, don't know if you want to say hi, Dong. <laughs> I, think, I think you're there. Um, but um, basically, uh, gonna, I'm going to sort of talk, talk very quickly about some of the new stuff in Doc 1.10. Um, I'm sure you've uh, already seen some of this stuff in the blog. Um, so the interesting bit is uh, Dong's going to demo some of these new features so you can see some of the stuff in action. And we've got some time at the end as well for questions because, I mean, the reason you're here and this isn't just a YouTube video is the fact that you can ask us questions and we can um, tell you in more depth some stuff which might be interesting to you. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Um, the first thing in Docker 1.10 is uh, a new compose file. So this is, um, if you've used compose before, compose is essentially a way of uh, describing an application in a single file, um, all of the containers that com you're comprising your application and how they connect together. And then in a single command, you can then boot up this application and just have it, have it running instantly. You don't have to type all of the you know, separate commands to get it to run. Get it to run. Um, and in previous versions of Compose, this basically just describes the containers that were part of the application. Uh, but in uh, the last version of Docker, in Docker 1.9, we added top-level concepts for networks and volumes. So networks were things that you could put containers into, and it was um, a, sort of a complete network where your containers could talk to each other. and um, we also added the concept of volumes, so you could create volumes and, and sort of mount them to containers, uh, which was both of these systems were much more flexible than the systems we had before. Um, but it wasn't supported in Compose, but now we've added full support for these things, um, essentially by allowing you to describe different objects in, in a Compose file. So the existing Compose file, um, which you can sort of see here, is underneath the uh, services uh, key in the compose file, which gives us the opportunity to add more stuff to the top level, uh, to the sort of top level of the data structure here. So you can see we've added networks and and volumes as well. And then in the services, you can then just you can then say which networks your containers are part of and which volumes you want to mount to each container. Um, so this gives you a whole load more flexibility in describing in describing what your applications are, and um, also gives us the opportunity to add more stuff in the future, which is quite nice. Um, so we aren't just constrained to, to you know, just be able to describe services. Um, and yes, that's a um, hundred mile an hour overview of, of what the new Compose file is. And I think the best way to demonstrate is, the, well, to explain what this is, is by demonstrating it. So I'm going to pass over to Dong now, who has a, a example which um, is actually complete and working, which you can which you can show you. Hello. Um, so in this setup, I have a swarm. Um, just use the swarm to demo how we can run a compose here. So the, in the compose file, you have um, demo that demo. Um, so you have known that uh, the major difference is we now have the version two, and then the top um, level system of uh, volume and networks. We define a backend network, uh, the volume, and then we can point it into the container. So to run that, I am now uh, just doing a Docker compose up. What it does is uh, it would start the corresponding containers and the network. Okay, let me show the network. Uh, 
I bet it's so the network. This is the overlay network created by the, um, um, this compose file. And then the volume. So I have two nodes, and on each node, Swarm would create the volume for them, and then mount it to the corresponding um, uh, corresponding container. So this is a dummy one. We just uh, I I just coded up. Uh, we have the voting app that is um, a real life um, um, compose um, demo app. Um, you can play with that. Um, that one would take uh, much more time to to bring it up, so we cut it short in this demo. Back to you, Ben. Cool. Thanks very much, Don. Um, and that was a very good um, example, actually, and something I, I forgot to mention is that, um, of course, the neat bit about describing a compose file is that you can describe your application once and take it across development and testing in CI, and then deploy it to production. And that example was a Compose application actually being deployed onto a Swarm. Um, so, you know, it's something you can take from your laptop and then scale up in production as well. Um, the next thing, um, sort of big set of updates in uh, this release is we have a whole bunch of security things. So in every, every Docker release, um, we've been doing a lot of work on improving security, and this release is no exception. Um, the two headline uh, things are the things that basically the, the two main things left that people have been asking for um, to secure containers themselves uh, are firstly set comp profiles, which are essentially a way of filtering uh, the syscall. You can, you can um, define very fine grained policy around what exactly your your container can do. Um, and we've also got sensible defaults applied to containers. Uh, so every container that now runs on, on Docker 1.10 will have some sort of sensible defaults to, to, to filter the syscall there exactly what each container can do. Um, we've also got username spacing, which has been a very common quest, um, which essentially, um, I mean, the way it works is each each container gets its own set of user IDs and group IDs. Um, so the containers inside, so the users inside the container are completely different from the users on the host. The sort of um, the thing that that is kind of most people have been wanting this for is so they can the root user inside a container is not the root user on the host. Um, and I know when I say that, that sounds really scary, um, but it's not quite as scary as it um, is made out to be. Like, obviously, we don't recommend that you run software inside containers as root, um, but if you're running stuff as a root user inside a container, that isn't actually the same thing as being the root user on the host, because all of the other things inside the container are namespaced. Um, so you're running in your, inside your own file system, you've got your own namespace set of processes, you've got your own namespace set of network interfaces and so on and so, so forth. Um, so even though you are root inside a container, um, you, there would have to be something like a kernel exploit or something accidentally injected inside the container that meant it was that you would actually be able to do stuff as root on the host. Um, so what this namespacing does essentially is give you an extra layer of protection. So even though, um, you know, having the same user IDs inside a container wasn't inherently dangerous, um, this does give an extra layer of protection in case there were exploits or things accidentally put inside a container um, and things like that. So you can safely run stuff as user zero as root inside a container and be comfortable about the fact that that isn't that doesn't give um, that might not accidentally give root root um, 
access on a host as well. Um, so this is really useful if you want to, you know, make sure that your containers are completely isolated from each other and from and from the, the host machine that they're running on. Um, so those two are sort of uh, container level um, security. So giving you really fine grain policy around what can run on containers um, and even more protection of what, what of isolating the stuff that's running containers. Another thing we've done for distributing the container images um, is that image IDs used to be randomly generated. So every time you created an image or tagged a, uh, well, every time you created a new image, sorry, not tagged it. Every time you created a new image, we randomly generated a image ID for that, um, for that image. It was, you know, it was the long, long string of numbers and letters. And now is we've now made that image ID, instead of it being random, it actually represents a hash of all of the content inside the image. And it's a Merkle tree style hash. So it's a hash of the manifest summary of the image and all of the layers in the image, which means that that image ID re represents the content that's inside the image, which is sort of like the same way that um, when you use a git sha hash to represent a commit, it represents that commit and the entire history of that commit before it as well. Um, and we're using a very similar system for image IDs now. And the neat thing about this from a security perspective is it means that you can do docker run image name colon and an image ID on a server and you can be confident about the fact that if you produce that image on your laptop and it got that image ID, if you run that image ID on a remote server, you can be confident that the content inside that image is what you expect it to be. Um, and this is not fully cryptographically secure, which is why we also have a content trust system um, with certificates. Um, but you know, just for the for for the general case, this is um, this is a much more uh, convenient way of representing and sort of passing around versions of images and so on. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and another sort of security related update in this in this release is we now have a plugin mechanism in Engine. Uh, for doing access control on a whole bunch of engine actions. So pretty much every API call that's made to engine um, is now can now be passed through um, third party plugins which you can write yourself or other people can provide. And indeed we're we're planning on on providing some of these with our with our commercial products as well. Um, so basically doing any kind of any kind of access control on on API actions against the engine. So you can control who can run certain, who can run containers, who can run um, access certain images, um, who can access certain containers, and uh, all of these sorts of things. Basically, and anything you you know you you you'd be able to do by um, sort of intercepting API calls. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pass over to. Uh, Dong now is going to give a quick demonstration of of setcomp and namespacing uh, to sort of show what is possible using these these two features. Thank you, Ben. Um, one note to the content uh, addressable image um, in the 110, um, the image would be regenerate a new ID. So when you upgrade to 110 it would take some time to migrate the image ID from the old one to the new one. That would um, stop your demand for a while. So if you want a smooth um, transition, you can run a migrator to migrate the image first before you do the upgrade. Okay, now I'm going to do a um, demo on the SecCom. So on the sitcom, what it what it does is um, 
you can define what action you allow the system to do, uh, allow the container to do, and what you, do, you don't want it to do. In this example, it's a change mode uh, adjacent file. You, uh, here, you default action you allow Um, I, I'll answer the question. We'll answer the question next. Um, so here we just specify the change mode. It's um, it's not allowed. So with that, when you run, um, we found we found the secure option. It's okay. But if you want to run it with the uh, with the change mode restriction, you would get an error. It would explicitly tell you that uh, this operation is not permitted under this uh, security profile. So this gives you a way to limit what the container can do. Um, so when sometimes you are using others code, you can you can put all the limits there. The next one I'm going to show, um, um, this is, uh, <clears throat> okay, let me show the, what, what, what I'm running first. In this Docker daemon, I'm running the daemon with a secure, uh, with a username space. Uh, set to default. That is to enable the user namespace. Now I'm trying to run Ubuntu. I'm getting there, and with the, with I am mapping <coughs> my directory into the system. So inside the container, it considers itself as root. But if you go to the files, as Ben said earlier, these files do not belong to do not belong to the root inside the container. So if I try to I try to change the file. I don't have the permission. So if you compare that with um, with here, I am the root, and the files belong to root. I can change stuff. Let's say move on. I can do that. So because the files uh, the files um, on the daemon on the host. It's mapped into uh, the container, but inside the container, the the root inside the container actually is not the root on the host. It's just a normal user. So that's how um, you create a sandbox, and at the same time, you can control what the privilege the sandbox has. Uh, you can also look at the, um, uh, the process ID to see what ID it has, uh, who, um, what is the owner of the ID. Um, ben, back to you. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, so the next slew of updates we had in Engine, um, which is also kind of uh, relate to the Compose updates as well, is a whole new uh, new set of networking features. And um, the first thing is that, well, actually, you know, it's given an update of networks, just in case you haven't seen these. Um, essentially, Docker networking um, is a really flexible SDN system for um, Docker containers. So you can... Uh, create networks and attach containers to networks, and then containers in the same network can can see each other on the same same subnet and communicate with each other. With each other. And the neat thing is that these networks that you create can be backed by a driver, which can 
either be the built-in multi-host driver, which means that when you create a network, it spans all of the engines that you might have in your cluster. Um, so containers can communicate across different hosts. Um, or it can actually be backed by just any third-party plugin at all and any third-party networking system. Um, so if you have any existing networking infrastructure or you have, you know, specialist requirements, um, you can use any networking system that you might, you might have, um, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and in this release, we've sort of, this is the first, um, in Docker 1.9, we were first released this as stable, um, and we've been hearing lots of feedback about how people have been using this um, and how we should improve it. Um, so we've just been sort of adding some of the top requested features in this next stable release after that. Um, and one of the top things is um, before Docker networking, we used to have a feature called links, which people kind of like, um, turns out. <laughs> and we. <laughs> We didn't implement links in the new uh, networks um, because essentially you don't really need it. When you add a container to a network, it can see every other container on that network by its host name. So uh, you don't actually need to link containers together to be able to get that container as an accessible host name in another container. And the one thing that people wanted was the ability to be able to alias the name of a container to something else inside the container, which links allowed you to do. Links allowed you to connect one container to another, and in the container that was linking to the other container, uh, you could give the container a different name. So the example here is that you might have a container running called production Postgres, but say you had a, a web server running inside a container, that expected to be able to connect to something called DB, expected to be able to connect to a host name called DB. Um, link allowed you to create this alias. So when you connected it to the other container, you could give it the, you, you could make the container called production Postgres available as the name DB. Um, so we've added that feature back. And to be able to do that, we've just, we've just used links. So you can now um, keep on, we, you can now use links in networks that you've defined yourself in new Docker networking networks, um, uh, which we think people are going to be quite excited about. And this is um, something that really helps with Compose as well, because a nice thing about using links in Compose is uh, that you can sort of explicitly define what depends on what. Uh, and when you define a link in Compose, it knows that, for example, it should start up the database before it starts up the web server, because the web server wants to be able to talk to the database. So by, by, by being able to use links like this in um, your networking, you can define those relationships between your containers explicitly. Um, and also as a nice side effect, as I mentioned, you can also alias the names. So that's links in user-defined networks. I think people are gonna be quite happy about, about links being back. Um, another thing we've added is the ability to set custom IP addresses. So when you, um, add a container to a network, or if you run a container um, and um, pass a network to Docker Run, you, you can also define what IP address that container should join the network as. So if for whatever reason your application expects there to be things at certain IP addresses, um, you now have the ability to be able to do that and give containers static IP addresses. Um, another thing we've added, which is quite similar to links, but um, is sort of a slightly different feature to this is when you um, start a container, um, it'll show up in a network as its host name. So if you start a container called DB, in all of the other containers and network, there will be, um, they will be able to access something under the host name DB. Um, but what we've also added is the ability for a container to have multiple aliases. So this is sort of the opposite thing to links in a, in a sort of funny way, um, in that when you start a container, you can give it multiple names. Um, so um, in all of the other containers, it will be all of the other containers on the network, it will be accessible by all of those names. Um, the example in um, Compose is that uh, we actually give 
containers multiple names, one with the project name prefix. So um, containers are both called myapp underscore db, for example. Um, but other containers in that side application might also want to be able to access that container by the name db. So we can give the db container two names. We can give the name myapp underscore db and the name db, and you'll be able to access it by both of those names from any container in the network. And another little thing, which hopefully you won't notice any difference in how things work, um, apart from it being more reliable, is that in the first version of Docker Networking in 1.9, uh, we did the hostname resolution in each container by writing to the file slash Etsy slash hosts. Um, we've now replaced this with a full DNS server system built into Docker Engine, which is essentially just much more um, reliable and scalable. Um, and hopefully you won't notice that, but it will make your lives easier. Um, so that's the sort of networking things. There's also a bunch of other smaller things, which as with all of the things we're talking about today, you can view the Docker 1.10 release notes to see the full list of stuff that's in, that's in this release. Um, but I'm gonna hand over to Zong now to demonstrate some of the some of these networking features. Over to you. Um, I'm going to use um, the same um, the same uh, swarm cluster to demo uh, how you can have this uh, use uh, the networking feature. So as I say, I have two nodes. Now I want to create um, not what uh, create an overlay network. Now we have the online meetup as an overlay network. Um, I'm going to create a container. Um, in this container, I would put it to the network. And I give it a name first. Um, but at the same time, I'm, uh, how about the alias? Um, on this network, now I just say um, BC box top, so it would just uh, run there. It's running on my first um, um, first document daemon, uh, this one. So I want to run another one to the second uh, host. So very similar. I would run, this time I just specify the network. Let's see. Uh, but I want to run it on another machine. So in that case, I give it a constraint. Say that this node, I prefer it to run on the second So the first thing I want to show is um, uh, the DNS. This is the uh, resolve file. It specify a name server on the local host. So this is the change that we do not we do not update the host file now, but we use a name server embedded uh, DNS server within the demand. Um, so with this one, now I am in an overlay network. I am on host two. Um, host two. Let me let's try to find um, C one. And how about C two? C two is an alias, but it's um, the DNS server would understand that. But when you look at um, um, the logical network, C1 
is the name on the network. C2 is just an alias. So if you show the app, um, the network entity, you only see C1. Okay, so um, yeah, that's uh, the feature on the overlay network and how uh, the DNS server and uh, how do you, how can you set them up and the network alias. Back to you, Ben. Cool, I think this is, um, the uh, next bit is pretty much, um, I'm not going to do much talking, but I'm going to pass straight over to um, you, Dong, I think, to demonstrate some of the uh, other new stuff in, um, other new cool things in the engine. Does that sound, does that sound good? Yep. Um, in the engine, there, so let's do a quick overview. We now have um, a complete uh, event stream definition. You can get a lot of information from stream. And then the, you can limit this I.O. You can update containers with source on the fly. Um, ah, there's one interesting feature is on the, um, you can reload it, you, you, you can reload the daemon configuration without restarting the daemon. Uh, for now, you can, re, um, you can turn on debug option or you can change the label of the daemon. Um, it's quite useful when you see something, when you want to uh, get more information from the daemon. So you can turn on the debug flag on the flight uh, without destroying the daemon. Sometimes you cannot easily reproduce your problem. So it's a handy uh, thing. Okay, let me get to um, show some of these features. Um, Docker update. So in the Docker update um, command, you can see that uh, this uh, like CPU, memory, um, bulk I.O. weight, you can update these um, parameters on the fly. Uh, let me start one. So let's say I docker run um, test container. Um, I put the um, CPU share Like that. So now I have um, the container, the test container here. I want to inspect it. Uh, you would see the CPU share and the CPU period here. The next step, I want to update it. So all the options are pretty much the same. What you need to do is just change, um, change the the constraint you want to uh, you want to update and change the, the command to update. Now run it again. You can see the change in the um, uh, CPU period. So you can do the same for other um, uh, constraints. It's, uh, it's quite useful when you, for you to dynamically update the resource allocation. So when you are running a container and you realize, oh, it's taking more memory, Oh, so you can change it instead of destroying it and restarting it. 
So that's uh, for the update command. Um, we have um, an update event uh, stream. So in the stream, it's uh, defining the time, um, the entity, the action, or the, the event type. Uh, the, the ID for the container, the image, its name, or other parameters for the network. It's the, the network's the name, network's type, uh, corresponding container. So this event stream, you can subscribe to it to build an event-driven um, um, system. So if you want to auto-scale your service, you can listen on, okay, which service has started, which has been destroyed, how many, um, how many number of instances is running there. So you can react to it quickly, automatically. Um, Uh, ben, do you want to talk about the swarm? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think we have much time to talk about it. Um, oh, but there is... let me let me go ahead then. I can do a demo on. The... Yeah, let's yeah. Let's go ahead with the demo and then let's get on to um, get on some Q and A because we've got some great questions from you from from all all of the participants. Okay, so the, in the swarm, um, the uh, we improve the swarm no management. So now the swarm manager has um, um, it would it would listen to all the events happen, happening with uh, each uh, daemon and try to update their status uh, quickly. So if some nodes uh, cannot fulfill a requirement, cannot uh, run a command, we get that as a feedback and automatically downgrade its priority. So you when you when you try to run a um, container to a daemon, and that daemon is not responding, you can automatically run the same container on the next live nodes. And also taken into this interaction, knowing that that daemon possibly is not good, so you would not, um, you would downgrade its priority. And at the same time, um, you keep probing it so when you come back, you can put it back into your workers queue. Uh, we are experimenting a rescheduling. The rescheduler is uh, allowed you to um, restart your container when uh, on another node when that node when the existing node fail. So if you have some workload, you want them to be uh, long running. When it fail on one node, we can schedule it on the next one. So uh, in the Docker 110 release, we have it as an experimental. Uh, we are we are going to improve it uh, so it can get to uh, production level uh, in possibly in next release. Uh, Swarm also allows you to run um, pull your image from your private repository. I'm going to demo the swarm, uh, how you can do the, um, when no fail, uh, what would happen. So, we have uh, two, con uh, two nodes. The first node um, has six container, the second one has uh, eight container. So if I am going to run Docker run hello, Hello world. Um, with the current strategy that is spread, it would choose the first one. Or to make it even better, I can actually put the constraint. Say that um, I prefer the first node. But at this time, I want to destroy first node. I actually stop it. So when we stop it, what would happen? Uh, sorry. 
Yeah. So now you get the response that uh, you cannot connect to it. But if I run it again, it, it went through. Although you prefer the first node, but because we stop it, the system already get the hint that that node is not well. So it would try to find the next live node that can fulfill the requirement. So you see the container um, did run on the second node. Um, so with that, you see uh, when what what is the error, when it's updated. If I put it back, the system would detect that uh, in a short while and put it back into uh, production. So that's the demo on Swarm. Um, let's get back to the questions. Um, Ben, back to you. Sure. Thanks, Dong. That was that was great. So we've got we've got a um, about five or ten minutes for um, some questions. You've been sending some great questions in the chat. Um, in fact, a lot of questions pointing out uh, stuff that I forgot to mention. Um, so thanks for that. I will uh, <laughs> definitely answer those questions because because my own failing. Um, First question, actually, um, it's a really good question, uh, which isn't pointing out something I forgot to mention, um, from Luke, um, which is, are data-only containers still used in the Compose version 2 file? Um, actually, this is a great point that volumes are a replacement for data-only containers. Um, data-only containers existed before volumes were around um, it was essentially a way of, of putting a bit of data inside a container and then you could do volumes from to sort of mount that data in a bunch of other containers you were running, which frankly was a bit of a hack to get around the fact that we didn't have a proper volume system. Now we have a proper volume system, you can create a volume to store your data instead of using a data, data only container. And then for each container you want to mount that volume in, you just mount it as a volume referencing the name of the referencing the name of volume instead of using volumes from. So no, we recommend you don't use data only containers anymore because volumes essentially replaces that behavior. Um, another question, um, what is the difference between the image ID and the image digest? This is a great question from uh, Leonid. Um, which is something I totally forgot to mention. So thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Um, in Docker, I can't remember what version it was now. I think it might have been Docker 1.6. We added a concept of an image digest, which was essentially a, another bit of metadata attached to an image that was a hashed representation of the content inside that image. Um, that was actually the first step on the way to us making image IDs content addressable, representing the content inside the image. Um, so the difference between the image ID and the image digest is essentially they're the same thing and image IDs now re replace image digests. So this is one way of thinking about this is this that image IDs are now in essence the image digest and this is sort of the next step improvement upon image digests. Image, adding image digest on the side was a bit of a hack because um, in that version of Docker, we didn't have the time to do all the refactoring to make image IDs content addressable, but we've now sort of reshuffled some of the internals to make that possible. Um, it's a great question. Um, image IDs now replace image digests. Um, another question, um, another really good question, which again was pointing out something I forgot to mention. Uh, the question is how, how does, how does, um, how do these volumes work with volume plugins? Um, what be the permissions inside the container? Um, so the way this works with volume plugins is this actually makes it much easier to use volume plugins. So each volume you create, you can specify uh, what, dri what driver is going to back that volume. So you can create a volume called uh, foobar and back it by um, 
some network attached storage system and you can then attach that to the to each container without each container having to worry about where that volume is actually being stored um, so these um, top level volume objects actually make it much easier for to, you, you to be able to use volume plugins because you just need to set up you know you just need to attach it to the volume you just need to create a volume and attach it to the volume plugin once and then you can use that to to connect it to containers um, and in your compose file you can specify when you when you specify volume you can specify the driver that that, that volume is backed by and also all of the driver options and the same applies to networks as well so networks can be backed by plugins um, you can do the same thing there and one of the reasons we added these top level objects was to make it much easier to configure these stuff and and back this stuff by by plugins um, let's have a look we're just about running out of time but I will uh, we'll see if there are any other questions here um, I have uh, questions on on my side yep go for it so um, the, for the first question, um, the, the, it's about the image the, um, image ID uh, and from Michelle Liu. Uh, I think that is um, mostly correct. So in also as Ben has described uh, before 110, the image ID is not the full content um, digest. It's not it has not taken the full image uh, content into consideration. So there was a poten potential conflict uh, between images. But with the 110, we resolved this problem. Um, um, yes. So there is um, potential conflict, although that was rare uh, before 110. And yes, uh, the next question, yes, the image ID would replace the digest. Um, the third question about Docker Slim, I haven't tried that. Uh, if you have information, I, I'm, I'm going to give it a try, um, but I haven't tried that. Thanks for the info. Um, about the swarm, um, Emma, do you have a specific question? No, okay, I go through the list. Cool, so I think I think we're pretty much out of time now. Um, but thanks everyone for attending this uh, meetup. We're gonna get the video and slides up online with the links to everywhere, um, to full release notes for all of this stuff. Um, and also links off to where you can download things and where you can uh, try things out. Um, if you want the really quick way to get started with all this stuff, including the compose file, um, quickest way is to just go to docker.com and download toolbox and um, follow our getting started guides and also the compose documentation um, and all of the other documentation, all of those other, other features on the website as well. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for attending. Um, and uh, hopefully we will see you soon at a at a future online meetup. Thanks very much, and Thank thanks, thanks very much to Dong as well for for doing all of the demos, um, and uh, our moderator Adam, who's been quietly organising things in the background as well. <laughs> thanks very much.